like to introduce Pete Pellegrino, who is a retired Navy commander and currently lead war game designer at the Navy War College. Uh, beyond his work with the Navy and with other services, he has done war, um, business wargaming consulting with Fortune 100 companies and has advised toy and game companies and has also advised schools on the use of historic simulations in engaging students in teaching. So with all this wonderful background, Pete brings great experience with him and we're thrilled to have him here. Thanks, Pete. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for that, Robert. So uh, as he said, we're, we are gonna go a little longer this time than our normal format, just because I've got a lot of examples I wanna show you uh, in terms of uh, things I'm going to call models. And we'll kind of get into exactly how I'm defining models uh, and, and how they support wargaming here uh, as we step into our brief. So to start here, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start pushing a screen. Uh, and that's never the one I want you to see. Hang on one second. There we go. You should just be seeing kind of a blank screen now with uh, my standard disclaimers, yes? You, some folks can nod their heads and I'll feel good that you're seeing it. Ah, there we go, I got a head nod. All right, so uh, obligatory disclaimers here up front. Uh, again, these are my opinions and, and views and not necessarily those of the college, the Navy or the federal government. Um, so this particular brief, and, and we kind of do these topics on demand based on what people's interests are. Uh, and back a couple of weeks ago, there was the Connections US slash Global Wargaming uh, Conference. And I presented uh, a pandemic model as part of that, talking about a game that we did in, in January of this year on pandemics. And it used a rather complex model. And a lot of people have asked questions about that model. Uh, and so that's kind of where this came from. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit, the pandemic model, but I, wa I wanna then use that as a springboard to talk about modeling and representation of non-player entities in general when we come to wargaming environments. Um, again, I'm gonna go and we'll have about 30 minutes or longer, depending on how long people want to stick around, for Q&A at the end. And we are recording this session, um, and we'll get out where the links are and where you can find these uh, afterwards. Uh, with that, this is the sixth lecture. It's a Wargamer's View of Models. I'm me as introduced there. And again, uh, if you've got a particular interest in some other topics, and you can look at what's on our online library for the, the things we've discussed, you can always get a hold of Robert and make some suggestions and and we'll see what we can put together. So with that, we're gonna start right here. So this should set the tone for the models. This is me and models, okay? Uh, I am not a professional modeler. I, you know, I did not, I, I, I haven't studied the mathematics or the representation mathematically of particular models and the idea of verified and validation in modeling and the V and V, et cetera. That, that's not gonna be my approach, all right? So I wanna say that right up front. So if you come from a quantitative math background and have done a lot of, of regressive modeling, a lot of modeling, I'm probably gonna irritate the hell out of you over the course of the next hour and a half because I'm gonna be using a very loose definition of models uh, and simulation and I'm gonna blur the two together and yes, there's differences. And we will talk a little bit about uh, the specific kinds of models, um, but in the end, I want you to keep remembering that I am approaching this from a war gamer perspective who needs to represent something in a game and not necessarily doing modeling to be able to do predictive analysis, okay? Uh, so this is the question I'm really trying to answer. I'm trying to address this. How do I represent something in a game uh, that is not necessarily being represented by the player? And then how are the players gonna interact with that in some fashion? Uh, and ultimately, all my models have to answer or have to be supportive of the game's objective. So how do I represent X when X isn't being handled by the player? What's the interaction between the player and this thing I'm gonna call a model, right? And how exactly does my answers to one and two support the game objective? <laughs> Awkward pause. All right, so first off, um, 
let's, let's think about the kinds of models that, that we can be tackling here uh, as we try to look at them and how we're going to use them in wargaming. So descriptive models, all right, are something that tries to represent the observable conditions. And to give you an idea, when I talk about the, how broadly I'm using this idea, a map right, is a descriptive model. It describes the world. It's not really the world. It's a, it's a representation of the world. All right? um, and maps are probably like one of the best examples of this idea of descriptive uh, models. Now, they don't have to be to serve their purpose, to meet an objective. They don't have to necessarily be, quote unquote, accurate against the real world. Um, if you've spent any time either in the Washington metro system or, or the London underground, um, you'll know that the map representation of the London underground is a stylized map that you actually can't use to navigate on the surface. It won't work. It, the, 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 uh, while the relative relationship of the stations are correct, uh, the actual, if you kind of like were to pop up through the ground up onto the surface, you'd find that they don't pop up to where they actually are uh, in the quote real world. So there's our map on the left is the, is the typical map that you'll see throughout the London Underground. Um, someone took it and tried to warp it and to show you what it would have to look like if it was really trying to align with the geography of London and the Thames River, right? And this is what you, you, you can kind of see the difference. Um, and a map is a good example, again, of the kind of thinking I'm gonna be presenting here where accuracy, okay, or, or precision, again, two different terms, but this idea that I don't have to be quote unquote true to be useful. As a matter of fact, if you look at the, in this example here, this is the Narragansett Bay. Um, uh, and the one on the left is a satellite view and is the most quote accurate. And it's absolutely useless if I'm a mariner. I would rather have the chart in the middle, right? Which has the detail where I need it and abstraction where I don't. But the one in the middle doesn't help me if I'm a tourist trying to drive around Newport in the summer. I'd rather have the map on the right. So already you can start to get this idea that our models have to suit a purpose and not just quote be accurate for the sake of being accurate. And what exactly does that mean? All right. So again, all things we're going to kind of circle back on here in a second. Okay. An explanatory model is one that's trying to describe the factors that are causing what we see, all right? It, it tries to answer the why question. And in our, my, little, my little weather examples here, you can see where we've gone from just simply what is, it's currently 73 outside and, and, and you know, somewhat cloudy there, uh, uh, to why it's that. There's a cold front here, there's a low pressure system here, and this is what's the shaping my weather. This is why my weather is the way it is. And then finally, we've got the predictive models where now we're looking at the situation where the inputs to the model are trying to tell me something in the future in terms of what I can expect. Now realize that in that predictive model, I can't change that model, right? There's nothing that I can do that's gonna change the hurricane or the projected path. I'll take actions based on the model. I'll think about whether or not I need to evacuate or not, or whether I'm gonna get sandbags and, and plywood to cover my windows. But I can't change the outcome of that predictive model. That's not the point of that predictive model. And often what we'll see in gaming is that the players are actually looking for feedback of if I do X, what happens? And they tend to start to think of that as being prediction, as opposed to actually it's probably more explanatory than it is predictive. And so we start to blur the lines between what is an explanatory model and what is a predictive model. And then we get into this situation, which is why I hear this all the time. I hear the we have to be careful or the players will learn the wrong lesson. And I'm not sure what's the wrong lesson for them to learn based on the model. And really what people are saying is, look, if people know that there's being a model used and the model tells them that X is gonna happen, they're gonna leave the war game thinking that's somehow true. And they can anticipate that in the future. So this is where a model and how we present the information from the model can start to shape people's perceptions. So on the left, we've got the original Lion King, right? And when you look at a cartoon depiction, okay, you can say, I clearly understand that's a cartoon depiction. And I know that things in cartoons can do things that don't quote really happen in the real world. So I understand that there's a degree of abstraction uh, and maybe fantasy that's being employed in that representation of a lion cub. Now you go to the latest remake 
with the high def uh, computer generated imagery for the Lion King. And now people start to go and look at it and go, oh my God, that looks like a real lion. And I see it doing things because it looks real. It must be real. And therefore the things that it's doing are representative of real lion clubs. Oh my God, I didn't know they could sing and dance. I'm seeing it right here in front of me. Now everyone goes, oh, this is a silly example. Yes, it is. But that's what happens when people start to engage in war games and start looking at a level of detail that models are representing and potentially start to say, well, the model says, and they've forgotten the fact that the model exists to serve a purpose. And that purpose may simply be to support game, to provide rapid feedback, not necessarily to predict the outcome of a war between China and the United States. We used to do a game at the college where it was all done on PowerPoint. The map was a PowerPoint kind of map. And so the tokens were just uh, PowerPoint iconology uh, that we plopped down on the map. And so it was very cartoony. And no one would argue with us when we put a token that said, you know, like for the US Army 4th Division, and we plopped it in Germany, just as long as it was in, within the German boundaries. You know, everybody got it, yeah, got it, okay. So the United States has employed, deployed that, that uh, footprint into Germany. And what does that mean? Is that signaling to Russia? What did that mean? Everyone's cool with it, it was good. Then we decided to go, so very cartoony on the left, then we decided to go to Google Earth as the representation. And now everyone's freaking out because, oh, wait a second. You, I've drilled down to where you've got the icon for the fourth division. And it works out to be this mountainous area where you could never put the fourth division. And it's like, well, it's the same place it was on the other map. It just didn't have topography underneath it. it, it it's, it's not relevant. Well, but that's where you've put it. No, that's where I'm representing it. So you can see where, because I introduced a level of detail and quote realism, all sorts of other baggage on the part of the consumer of the model, the person looking at the map, the maps or models, um, began to get in the way of what the model was simply meant to represent. So again, I'm trying to set kind of a, a background uh, for you to appreciate where I'm coming from, where I talk about models and how I use them in war games. And one of the parts of the model where people talk about the validation of the model, meaning that they're looking at the model and they look at the outcome in the real world and see that the model in the real world, they match, all right? I've got it right, okay? The problem is you can do this with physics, right? We, we sit there and you can be Galileo, right? Watching that, uh, that chandelier swing in the chapel and timing the pendulum motion with your heartbeat and start to do some math and figure out that, well, if my mathematical model of pendulum motion is correct, then a pendulum, with a 25 foot chain and should swing so fast. And I can check that and see if I got the math right, all right? Ballistics, the same way. If I have an angle, I have a vector, right? And I can chuck that ball out there. And if wind, uh, you know, air resistance and planetary rotation are negligible, I can tell you where that ball's gonna land every time and test it and, and confirm it. So when we come to complex, especially military situations, where people are looking at models that are supposed to be grinding together lots of moving factors, What's my validation against it in the real world? I have people all the time tell me, oh, your, the outcome of your, your adjudication is unrealistic. This is, oh, okay. So you've got some experience with large scale naval combat in the 21st century? No, you don't, <laughs> all right? So we propose that we know how these things are gonna turn out, but we don't really have the ability to take some of the things that we, we wanna model, these soft, squishy interactions that we like to model, and we don't have a whole lot to bounce them against in the real world. So we're taking a stab at it. But we're trying to do this again, not to predict, but to inform play, to round out the game and provide another mechanism that either designers can use to help design their game, players can use to start to understand the cost benefit trade-offs in doing things, or adjudicators can use to try to come up with a quick answer that moves the game forward, all right? Um, we'll, we'll potentially have a whole separate discussion about adjudication uh, as a, again, it's a separate thing. So the obligatory George Box uh, quote, if you're gonna talk about models, and that all models are wrong, right? Some models are useful. There's always gonna be something short in your model, right? And so then we have to think about, well, again, how, how are we gonna then approach these models? All right, and here's a several quotes from folks that have, uh, have, have had to wrestle with models to some degree. Um, uh, and you can see the words I got highlighted here, uh, this idea of, of economy, of, of elegance and simplicity. This is what we're really looking for as I build these models. I'm not looking to add additional detail and keep adding stuff and adding stuff to the model. 
in quote, trying to get it more accurate. I, I don't care. Um, in my game design in general, that if someone comes to me and says, we need to include something in the war game, I go, okay, Roger, wh what's that? And they, they, they throw out this factor, this element, I'm kind of going, well, why are we adding that? And he goes, well, we'll make it more realistic. And I go, I don't care if it's realistic, right? Realism as an end is not what the game is about. If I need a lot of realism, then we probably should be off exercising and be out in the real world because there's nothing realer than the real world, right? So instead, I'm trying to create something abstract that will serve a purpose that real world experimentation or, or field exercises hasn't necessarily been a practical solution to try to explore the problem at hand. So minimal detail, abstraction, simplification, that's what I'm going for when we start talking about these different kinds of models. And adding complexity is not going to help, right? It's not going to probably improve my process uh, or make things somehow, quote unquote, better. I think in an earlier example, we may have talked about the whole problem with moot court. Okay, if you're familiar with, with uh, uh, the uh, court where my wife is an attorney, law school, um, and part of that is to do these mock trials where they're arguing in front of judges. And those rooms, those courtrooms where they do this, uh, if you were to look at them, you'd see a lot of things missing, right? It's not a quote, realistic in terms of having all the pieces, parts that you'd expect to find in a real courtroom. And one of them, for example, is the bailiff. There's typically no bailiff in there. Why do they need a bailiff for? They got a bunch of law students who are really there to argue and get that practice of arguing before a judge or a panel of judges. Now, and so a bailiff serves no purpose. You could put him in there for quote, out of realism, but you're wasting somebody's time to stand around and pretend to be a bailiff. Now, if, however, your objective was to have exposure to what could happen in a courtroom in terms of a violent uh, uh, witness or some other security risk that manifests in a courtroom, then a bailiff is a crucial part of that. But I'm not going to add the bailiff just to add the bailiff because someone says, hey, you know, bailiffs make it more real. Uh, I need to know what our objective is. So no matter how complicated this thing is that we're going to try to tackle in, in talking about models today, okay, you can break it down into simpler parts. And that's how I start. Okay, so we're going to start with looking at some of these the smallest little pieces parts uh, and the approaches I've taken to building various, and these are almost all Excel based models, models, okay, um, that we're going to look at that are really just tools that I've used in, in uh, over uh, 16 years of wargaming. So what started this whole thing off was this idea of the contagion model. And contagion was a model that I built over about a two month period, November to December of 2019, to support. Uh, a pandemic game that we were playing at Dartmouth University. Um, and this model is a bear. There's over 50 some sheets that comprise the Excel model. You can see here moving along the right hand side of the screen, some of the different screen captures that are all internal to this model. All right. And this is the model that kind of got people asking me about models uh, and, and building stuff in Excel. And, you know, and in some ways they would look at contagious and say, oh my gosh, I could never do that. Um, and it's like, well, actually you can, right? Um, but you don't start with something as complex as Contagion. I mean, Contagion took uh, 45 minutes to program one move into it. Uh, it took it about six minutes to crunch the math to spit out uh, or an answer. Um, and, and we can look at Contagion a little bit, but, but in some ways it's almost overly complicated to make the point. Um, but what I wanna show you with, with, from this idea of Contagion was how Contagion, this complex pandemic model kind of built out based on relationships. And that's really the heart of modeling for me, right? Is understanding the factors that are influencing uh, and how are influencing the outcome of something and how those all relate. So when it came to contagion, right? Which had 21 cities in the United States, complete demographic modeling, um, as well as, as uh, modeling of the international and nat uh, domestic airline routes between all those places uh, and some 20 uh, major international hubs. Uh, highway transportation system was modeled. Um, seaports uh, and sea routes were modeled. Uh, vaccination rates, uh, the disease itself had lots of parameters. Uh, we had the National Guard in there. We had all sorts of stuff in there. Um, but it all started with this, a little tiny bubble of people. And I started with one group of humans, right? I just wanted to get the model and the model is based on uh, a uh, SIRD model, uh, which is, and we'll talk a little bit more about SIRD models, but they're very basic um, models developed by uh, Sir uh, Roland Ross to, to study pandemics and, epidemi and, and epidemiology. 
and it stands for susceptible, infected, recovered, and dead. All right, in that flavor of it. So I just needed to get a little SIR model that would work for one small group of people, right? And when I did that, uh, I basically started with just, you know, these right here. I just started with kids, all right? I just needed a, a batch of people to see if I could get the model to work. And then we're gonna add other components to that and build it out. All the components ultimately that'll be part of this model, I said I needed the transportation part of it. So there was a part where I had to look at and pick out my transportation nodes and pieces. I wanted business closure to be part of that model. So, well, what business am I gonna look at? What am I gonna model? Am um, I gonna look at a government uh, activity? Are we gonna look at schools? Are we gonna look at industry? The answer is yes to all of those, all right? There's gonna be obviously to be some role of vaccines are gonna have to play some role in this game. It's one of the key decisions that the players are asked to make is about how to manage their vac vaccine supply and who to vaccinate, okay? I'm gonna inevitably have people end up in hospital. All right, and no matter how well I do it, hospitals are gonna end up by having some percentage ending up in the morgue, all right? There's gonna be fatality, mortality is associated with the disease. So I'm gonna to have to think about how that works. Um, we had a reason that they wanted to include the National Guard as a role to think about it, as a resource to manage, so we had to add them. Um, I had to add money as a classic resource to impose cost in a model. But the model had to support something. And this is not just modeling for the sake of modeling. What we're really trying to understand with the model was the, the players were asked to minimize economic loss while at the same time minimizing mortality during a pandemic using this particular model. So I had to start linking stuff together. Right? And obviously money was gonna get linked to the vaccine because that's what we used to buy the vaccine with. The vaccine's gonna get linked to the people because that's where I, what I use the vaccine for is to not pay people. People have a, obviously an impact on the economy. People who aren't working because they're sick aren't working. There's a lost uh, wage problem there. Um, but then some of those people are gonna end up in hospital. Right? And the people that end up in hospital, then potentially um, there's a monetary cost of maintaining hospitals and hospital beds and hospitalization and, and uh, applying things like Tamiflu to the folks in antiviral who are in the hospital. Right? Um, the National Guard had a link to hospitals because they actually bring combat support hospital capacity uh, to the problem. Um, but inevitably, despite our best efforts, we are going to have mortality. So there's going to be some sort of mortality rate that's from the hospitalization side is going to link to a mortality figure. Okay, back up at the transportation. Transportation is going to have obviously a link to the people because that's how people move around. That's how the disease gets moved around is through our transportation systems. Um, but at the same time, impacting the transportation system impacts the economy because I'm also probably screwing with the movement of goods and tourists as a contributor to an economy. Down at the bottom then, we've got to link those businesses to the people. It's the people who matter when I close a business. All obviously has an economic impact as well. And then finally, if I start closing things like I can't, I can just say, well, I've closed the highway. Well, okay, what, everyone's just gonna voluntarily get off the highway? Eh, I probably need to put some sort of security force, law enforcement, et cetera, to enforce some of these quarantines, to enforce some of these blockading. And that was a role in the model we attributed to the National Guard. All of this start, oh, and ultimately there's one last piece in terms of, and death has its own impact on economic activity. All of that, for as complex as it ended up, I started off, as I said before, with one little group of people. I got the vaccine, this part here, the vaccine to people part to work for just that. That's it. That's all I did. I had so, so many thousand people. I had an SIR model that said that if I give uh, those, expose those people to a disease with a certain infection rate, with a certain hospitalization rate and a certain mortality rate, I should expect to see over time, so many people get sick, so many people recover, so many people die. And I, I, that's the first thing I had to get right. And when I was happy that that was stable and my Excel spreadsheets weren't doing funky things and I wasn't getting errors and, and crash out messages, then I said, okay, now how does vaccination affect that? So then I linked my little vaccine model, my little va the vaccination concept to that little piece. And I kept adding a piece part. Well, then I just replicated it and called it young adults, which I then replicated again and called my working adults. And I replicated again and called my elderly. Now I needed to have the ability though, to vary things like mortality rate amongst that demographic. So, okay, before I get too crazy and start connecting up other stuff, I now need to make that part of the model a variable. And I just kept doing this and I set that aside. Then I went and I did the transportation part. Well, transportation goes between two points. So once I just go, was able to look up the data and find out about this type of stuff, then I had to figure out, 
okay, well, I need to make one of these and call it Houston. And I'll make another one of these bubbles and call it Dallas. Now I'll connect the two and get that right. And I just kept building out, adding parts, adding parts. So that's all of that. But to show you how that all worked in Excel wouldn't would be terribly useful. So we're gonna show you something called rising waters. Rising waters was a simple little model I threw together over the course of about five evenings. Uh, to show you the same approach that I took to building that monstrosity that became contagion is something a little more digestible. Now, um, the rising water problem, I pulled most of the data that supports this from the city of Miami Beach. Okay? This is not a hypothetical problem for Miami Beach. Right? Uh, they are seriously looking at, and this was a study done back in March of 2017, um, looking at routine flooding problems they're having in Miami Beach and, and how they're gonna address this uh, either due to climate change or whatever factors are driving up the number of times that Miami Beach floods. So I had data to pull from, right? That's the first thing you can do, go do some research, go do some homework, find some data, okay? And so the most core little piece of the model that I wanted to start with was just this simple idea around rising temperature equals rising seawater, sea levels, right? That's it. That, that, that's the first little piece I'm gonna start with, right? Now, there are lots of factors that potentially go into that, uh, whether you're talking about the thermal expansion uh, of the water, melting sea ice, glaciers, uh, I, I, I didn't care, right? Because this is the first abstraction I'm gonna make. I'm not looking to model this part of it. I'm not looking to see what, from a predictive perspective, how much temperature can change sea level. I'm gonna let somebody else tell me that, right? And in this case, the literature I found said, a set of numbers. And again, this isn't to try to validate or, or uh, the climate change, or I don't, don't care for the purpose of the demonstration here. But the first piece I had to seize upon was this idea that a degree Celsius increase in global average temperatures can mean a one to three meter rise in sea level. I'm gonna take that as a statement of fact, and I'm gonna go with that. So with that, it's easy to construct a table. I'm gonna assume that's a linear relationship, right? First set of assumption, but I'm gonna make it linear. Why? Because linear is easy. We'll talk about other types of, of mathematical function here in a bit, but linear, linear tends to be pretty easy. So it's not very hard then to figure out how to construct a table then between, and I went up to three degrees Celsius. Why? Because I just picked that number, right? Uh, and then make a little table that says, well, then if I think it's a meter to a degree, then half a degree works out to be half a meter. If I think it's gonna be more like two meters to a degree, three meters to a degree, so I now have a little table. All right, and you look at some of the numbers that the table then will spit out. And obviously three degrees at, uh, at three meters will end up with be nine meters. Isn't that a big deal? Well, back to, back to Miami Beach. This is a cross section through the southern end of Miami Beach Island. Remember, I'm Miami Beach, not the city of Miami, but the city of Miami Beach is on an island, basically well, about three miles uh, uh, east of uh, Miami. So there's a bay in between. And this is a cross section of South Beach. All right, so if you can see, on the bay side, South Beach is only 2.4 feet above mean sea level, all right? All the way across, and it's only about a mile or so across uh, the, the, the strand there, um, until you get over to Ocean Drive where you're all the way up to five feet. Um, and then with the dune line at the beach sand, you're at 11 feet. So uh, remember, you know, two meters, uh, even if you, just, if you just grossly make meters equal to be yards, you know, that's six feet, right? So almost, any increase in sea level is going to be a problem for Miami Beach, and it is now, right, as some of those pictures you saw were. So I've got to add another part then to the model, because sea level rise by itself isn't interesting. It's, it's rise relative to terrain and where humans hang out is interesting. So now I need to have these three parts, temperature, sea level, terrain level, and I should be able to build something, all right? But I'm going to have to start with a simple, little simple um, representation of the of the thing. And so I took what's called a strip model approach, right? I said, look, I should be able to imagine a strip of land. And that's what we see here, a little strip of land. And based on this strip of land, here's my little strip of land, say that I know if this is the normally just deep water, so it's always wet. Um, and then all these little squares all have terrain elevation. And if the water level is higher than the terrain, then the terrain floods. And if it's lower, it doesn't, all right? Well, that's a pretty simple first little rule to work with. If the sea level is higher than the terrain, the terrain gets wet. All right, but then we got this little problem where what happens when I've got these little dips, you know, Death Valley is below sea level, but it's not flooded, okay? 
So I need to have this situation where I think, well, wait a second, there's gotta be another rule. It can't just be, if, I, if the drain is lower than the water, it's wet. And if it's higher, it's dry, because I get this problem here. So basically, I modified the rule to say, okay, I'll hang on. If, it's, uh, if I'm lower than sea level and I'm already adjacent to water, then I flood. But if I'm lower than sea level, but all the ground around me is, is dry, then I don't flood. My two rules, that's it. The only two rules that are driving this little model. So if true, meaning I'm low and I'm adjacent to water, then I'm gonna be W for wet. And if that's not true, then I'm D for dry. The simplest first part of this model is all I did was I just got this little piece to work in Excel and it's not too hard to figure out you know, how to do that. So then I started to construct a little table, right? With a distance and I picked 200 meters because I picked 200 meters, right? Sound like a pretty decent distance. So 200 meters uh, and then laid out a terrain, a little train piece. And I'll show you the actual train numbers, but just one strip, right? Now that strip though, I then duplicated 20 times to get the idea that, okay, so if I get one strip to work, I'll duplicate it. Now I have a, a swath of land that I can look at my little model for. And it's all using this, this uh, adjacent and below than sea level logic behind it. All right, so now I have a larger table uh, that with conditional formatting is trying to figure out whether it should be blue or green or wet or dry, all right? So what do I have here? I got a little bit of a data table. I've got two logic statements, sea level versus elevation and adjacency. I've added a conditional format, blue for wet, uh, D means dry and it'll be green in the model. And there's two variables we can monkey with. And we can monkey with the temperature and how much uh, sea level per degree change. So based on that, I get this. This is what I call my little rising water model. And, I, and I'll show you the, what's underneath this because this is exactly the same approach I took to building the contagion model, All right? This is the pretty top end, right? But let's just, let's decompose this for a little bit and we'll see what we actually are working with here. Okay, most of these models are what I call a three layer model, okay? The bottom layer is the, is the data layer, right? And this is where we're gonna have all our tables and formulas and, and it's gonna be a mess down there, but that's where all the big tables uh, and heavy math is being done. And typically the user of your model will never see this layer, right? Because it's, it's, it's scary and, and difficult to interact with. Above that, figuratively speaking, will be what we call the selection layer. And the selection now layer is where the user starts to interact with the kind of a, of, a, of a front end to get to the back end, the front end. And this is where they put numbers in boxes where they can use sliders and scroll tools and fill in the blanks and drop downs to ask for information from the data layer. And then based on the formulas you're using, we'll talk more about these in a second, it'll go and quote unquote fetch the information and stick it on the top layer. But if you want pretty, right, and I like pretty, if you want something that has a, a, a pleasant GUI, a, a graphic user interface for the player, then you need the pretty layer, which is the final layer on the very top, okay? And with the pretty layer, this is where I'll plant those Excel charts. Charts are great ways to represent data in a much more visually appealing fashion. And this is where you can go and start grabbing stuff out of PowerPoint and chucking it on top of your selection layer to make it all look pretty and smooth and professional. And that's how we end up with um, the rising water model that you saw. And we'll, and we'll look at the actual model in a second, but I wanna take you through each layer here, okay? So bottom layer, data layer. This is where you got your tables. This is where you got your variables defined. This is where most of your heavy math is occurring. It's all down here. It doesn't have to be pretty, but it ought to be organized, right? So you know what's going on down here and you know where then to point your selection layer to go find what it needs in the data layer. And you can have more than one data layer, data sheet. I had 30 some data sheets in that contagion model and some of them were really big. But this is where all the ugly tables were and math and again, it had a little bit of organization to it. So I could just keep straight of what's, what's down there, right? And you should hide this one from your user. This is use the hide sheet function to bury this thing because you don't want anybody down here. Um, uh, it's not that you're trying to hide what you're doing. You just don't want them inadvertently to come down here and start messing with stuff and wrecking formulas or breaking links. So I bury this. On top of that though, this is where you put your selection layer. And selection layer is, if the bottom layer had a lot of math going on, your selection layer has a lot of reference, logic, um, and lookup going on, right? So this is where you can sit there and selectively go and fetch using things like vertical lookup, horizontal lookup, uh, index and match functions, 
uh, which are all Excel uh, lookup and reference formula, to go and grab pieces, parts that you need. Okay? You can also use the form controls. And these are where you get the things like the little spinner arrows, you know, this right here, this little, ooh, there we go, right here, you know, the kind of little up, down, click up, click down type of things. Over here, I get a scroll bar function. I'm using this. Um, these are not normally in, uh, visible to uh, an Excel user unless you go to options uh, and you go down to customize your ribbon bar and you turn on the developer tools and they'll all pop up. Um, a word of caution here, depending upon who you're making these, these models for and what networks you plan on running them over, right? Um, you can do a ton of stuff uh, if you're familiar with v VBA, Visual Basic for Applications. This is the language that macros uh, and all of the Microsoft Office products work with, right? And I've written, I've made some really clever stuff with macros, but the problem with macros, as soon as you introduce them to a government or a military network, the macro security police, your IT department will probably have them all shut down. Right? And it becomes very difficult to then to enable anything because it goes against IT policy, because this could be malware. And unless you have control over your network, like at the Naval War College, where we have our own self-contained networks, and I can put this stuff on my own networks, um, but I cannot distribute it beyond that, uh, macros are going to get you into trouble. Likewise, active X controls can get you into trouble. So I try to the greatest extent possible to build all my stuff simply out of formula and form controls, because that pretty much so will be will work across all networks, NMCI, uh, government, military, et cetera. So other things you can you can monkey here with are this is where again you may want to uh, start hiding some columns to tidy things up a little bit um, because it just makes it easier to put it on this page, pull it up from the data page, put it here so you can see it. Um, conditional formatting, this is where you can get into colors, and I'll show you how you can manipulate those to make something pretty. Data validations. The data validation function this is where you can sit there and go, hey, user, I only want numbers between, you know, one and 10. Hey, user, here's the pull down of the options you have to pick from. A lot of these now with data validation is you're trying to make sure that the user only puts in, quote, valid data, meaning it's only data that the model responds to and you've got structured. That's all under, val uh, under data validation in Excel. And finally, this is where you're going to start one of the locking stuff down. You're not going to hide this. All right, because the user, has, this is the, the basic, the underneath part of the, the basic uh, of the front end or the middle end, right? You can't hide this, but you're going to need to protect it to make sure that, again, people don't inadvertently wreck formulas or break links. So now on the very top is where we have my pretty, okay? And pretty is where you can sit there and go and, like, again, with my rising water model, um, I've got this little power boat going across the top because it looks pretty. All right, I just went and, you know, you Google and find a, find a power boat icon, throw it on the top of the map. Um, oft times for labeling, I won't use cells for labels. I'd rather just use a text box because I have far more control over the appearance, size, and placement of a text box than I necessarily do with a cell. However, there are, there may be times where you dynamically need text to change in response to the model, in which case you will stick it in a cell, but still, you can still do some formatting tricks around that so that your text is at least easy to read in a logical place on the, sh on the sheet, et cetera, okay? Uh, this is where you want to put your graphs. I already mentioned that graphs are great visual representations of the data that you're trying to, to show uh, the model, how, how the model show. Now, and you'll see when we hear when we play with rising waters that what my little terrain cross-section model with the rising water on it, this little widget, this little right here, all this is a, was started off life as a bar graph. I am simply using a bar graph to plot the height of each one of those little segments in the slice. Right, and then I switch from bar graph to, to um, shaded area and boink, I got something that now actually looks like terrain, right? But that's all it is, it's just a graph, right? That I kind of repurposed a bit, right? Probably the most useful thing, if you want to start getting into pretty, are building what I call masks. You can build these in PowerPoint, and if, for the example here with this part right over here, and we'll look at it here in a second, this uh, temperature portion where I've got this up-down control, all right? What I did was I built, come on over there. I built a, oh, there it goes. I built a little transparent square with a, with a thermometer shaped cutout in it that is now resting over top of either a linked image, which in Excel, you can do that. You can take a quote unquote picture of a group of cells and then as those cells change, the picture changes. Or you just put this right on top of your selection layer where you've got conditionally formatted cells changing color, right? So 
back to my contagion model, everyone was enamored with this, this map I had with all these cities and the cities were changing color from blue to red, yellow, green, depending upon the level of infection. And the cities were simply little holes in a map, you know, screen capture of Google Earth that I put into PowerPoint. Um, there's a tool in PowerPoint that you can either create transparency or cut out, did that, and then laid it back on top of my Excel spreadsheet. And now those little dots are simply light shining through a hole, but they look like they're dynamic dots changing color. It's just a mask, that's really all it was. So, well, all of that, let's just go ahead and quickly look at rising water. And give it a second here to load. And um, here we go. So here's rising water, right? And the first thing, let's, let's, let's first, let's kind of run our, my water back to the, there we go. So, well, if we start off with here, uh, zero degree Celsius, so uh, no, no sea level rise. We have the rise per degree set at two meters out here. I've just built a little fake little terrain world in PowerPoint and made it semi-transparent so you can see my formatting underneath become visible, right? So as the temperature increases, what? Oh, I'm starting to get water. Already I'm getting water uh, with just a tenth of a degree change in temperature and the corresponding rise in sea level, given the terrain that this represents, I've already got water intrusion 50 meters up the beach in this case right here. Now over here, I can take this little slider, align it to that spot, and over here, you can now see the terrain change, the, the profile. Well, that's why it's coming up so far. That's a really flat part of the beach, as opposed to some other part, or maybe over here, where, there we go, where ah, I get a steeper profile. And that's why the water's not coming up as much. If the temperature continues to climb, you can see the water is pressing farther and farther inland. Oop, oh, it just looks like we just got over a big chunk of uh, tall, uh, tall terrain. Now I got massive flooding in through here. I'm, I'm pushing, back. and this is all it does. You can you know, change how much the water goes up by degree, and you can see it's pushing in further and further. If I just want to use the average, not a particular piece of terrain, that's now, you can see that, that little column goes away. And now it's just using the average terrain across what I've built. This is all it does, all right? It just kind of make, shows this little pretty picture of my town flooding. Uh, and as we, if this was part of the first part of a game trying to show folks, hey, if this is what happens, this is what's gonna flood. And you can see down here, in our graph, how high up the water is, how deep it is, what it's flooded over, so it goes. All right, now, like I said, that's the pretty top layer. And just Excel, if we, if we peel away the pretty, this is what's underneath, right? It's that terrain model, and as I use selectors, and I change the math, this table is running down using a lookup function, checking the height of the ocean, based on our ocean table down in the data layer and the height of the terrain and based on that and the formatting rules, it's see the changing it from green to blue. That's what it's doing, all right? Got a couple other things up here I wanted to hide from my user. So those were tucked away. Um, but again, you can see basically I had windows here and those windows more or less align with a mass. So it looks all pretty on top, but they're just cells in Excel, all right? Finally, down at the data layer, this is what I've got in the data layer. Here are all those terrain slices with all the height of the terrain. So I can sit there and go, you know, 80 meters in and, and 50 meters across the beach is 3.7 meters high. You can go to Google Earth and just run your cursor over a chunk of area and start picking off terrain elevations, all right? So that's essentially what's down here, all right? Here's these, pick, these cells that they change the colors based on formatting. That then goes up underneath to make my little dashboardy things climb up and down that are underneath here. Uh, and that's the whole model. It looks pretty. It gives them people some quick feedback as to potential impact based on two parameters, okay? Temperature, sea level rise. That's it. That's all this model is doing, right? But it was built, Contagion was built the same way. Three layers, just a lot of stuff on each layer. So let's go back here and let's return to our model. So that's what I started with, temperature, sea level, terrain but I'm changing the temperature. Well, what if, if part of this, imagine this is all part of some sort of, of uh, coastal resiliency game that we're trying to play with, with the, a town, right? And rather than just have the temperature arbitrarily go up and down, well, we can model, well, what's causing that, right? And again, from a very simplistic viewpoint, understanding that atmospheric science is wicked complicated, right? But if you do a little research, uh, I pulled up an EPA website, uh, they, they basically attribute these three out of four uh, of greenhouse gases of being the biggest problem, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane. 
Okay, so now you can say, well, what's, what's the contribution of the carbon dioxide part to the temperature? Um, and you can sit there and say, well, uh, there's a part of burning fossil fuel and the part about deforestation. Uh, vegetation forests take out carbon dioxide, burning stuff puts it in. Yes, all of that has pieces parts too. But again, how complex do you want your model to be? And you can keep, again, as I said before, you can go to a place like the EPA's website um, and it'll talk about each of the gases, the degree to which it can, seems to contribute, um, and mitigation strategies that you can potentially build into this model pieces part at a time. And again, I'm not here to validate the EPA's work. I'm simply trying to say that this is a way to approach modeling. Okay, nitrous oxide, fertilizer contributes to that problem as well as burning. Um, agricultural activities, sheep and cow, uh, contribute to our methane problem, right? But none of those are things that necessarily my little local community of Miami Beach is going to be able to address, but they could do things to change the terrain. And I can simply make a mechanism in my model that allows them to change the relative terrain. Okay? When you build a seawall, you're basically putting in a strip of higher terrain, right? When you do other construction techniques, you're essentially changing the configuration of the earth and the way water runs across it. So you can change those numbers. This is no kidding what they're doing, right? They're elevating structures. They're putting utilities up on stilts. They're hardening manhole covers and putting lips around them so the water doesn't go pouring down into the utility manholes, all right? They are changing the shape uh, to try to control flooding in Miami Beach. But I need all of this to be then connected to a cost. Games where all you do is sit there and play around with the model and say, well, what happens if this happens? Oh, isn't that cool? Aren't very interesting. So I somehow have to try this to cost, right? And again, or, or some other cost benefit thing, money is always an easy one, all right? Uh, because it's easy for people to kind of grab, wrap their heads around, but then you have to figure out what is exactly the cost of doing construction. That's straightforward, but what's the cost of carbon controls and carbon taxes? Maybe get a little more harder. And maybe that part of the game is really meant for them simply to realize there, there may be policies they're trying to advocate for their government and international communities to try to help <laughs> Miami Beach, okay? That was how I built rising water, which is the same approach I took to building the contagion model for the pandemic game. Now, uh, what I want to talk about next is what's called the marvelous math machine. And I want to then show you a, a tool that it, I use this tool to build another tool. The marvelous math machine is really to make up for the fact that you don't remember your high school math. I don't remember my high school math. And I'm sure that at one point I had to take a test where, you know, I looked at all of these graphs down here, and I should have remembered, you know, out of a multiple choice question, if that shape, is that quadratic, linear, exponential, logarithmic? Yeah, 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 I don't remember anymore, okay? So I need help, right? So that's what this does, is if you have the vague sense of a relationship, and you think you want to try to represent it mathematically. Now, caution here, a colleague of mine, Stephen Downs Martin, hates it when you start running around and start assigning quantitative value a qualitative assessment and then wanting to do math with it, right? Because it'll just lead to bad results, right? Just because it's a number doesn't mean you can necessarily add, subtract, divide, or multiply by it. And his joke is always take your birthday, that's a number. Uh, add it to your driver's license, that's a number. What do you get? Well, you don't get anything. Yes, that's right. They're numbers, but it doesn't mean you can add them together. It's a whole nominal versus cardinal number argument. But I'm, again, trying to make a representative tool that somehow gives the players a sense of understanding. This is that explanatory model over how things work and what the relationship are. So taking this one, for example, um, if you're interested in uh, population, for, okay? So <laughs> this is, if you're trying to model uh, how many rabbits there are uh, in, in the woods, um, population or environmental carrying capacity tends to be an S-curve function, okay? Where you got a couple of rabbits to start, then rabbits start doing what rabbits do and they start to reproduce very quickly and I get a spike, but then they start eating up all the food uh, the wolves show up and the foxes show up and their population starts to level, level off at a carrying capacity. It's an S-curve type function. So if I were trying to think about how some relationship, it used to be over here, uh, the uh, asymptotic relationship. This, is what, this was the relationship between unemployment and inflation, okay? Until the last like five years or so, then we kind of, it's kind of these economists just scratch your heads and goes, maybe that's not quite right. But the idea is start with something you kind of think is true. And when in doubt, I have two rules. When in doubt, the world is a 50-50 crapshoot, and when in doubt, everything is linear, <laughs> right? It may not be true, but it's a good place to start. So what this uh, little tool lets you do, and we'll look at the actual tool itself. All right, let's go over to it. Marvelous Math Machine, somebody says, look, start with something you think to be so. 
All right. I think, I think some relationship I'm going to try to represent is essentially exponential because of the way it curves like that. I, I think in my, my gut, my little bit of research I've done, that seems to be how, how this popular support model works, where people are kind of quiet and they kind of freak out when they hit a tipping point. Then you're just going to go to that one on my magic math machine. All right. And if you look at it and go, yeah, but I don't think it's that steep, maybe you can start playing with the, these parameters and say, oh, maybe it's a little flatter. Uh, well, well, maybe it's more like that. Yeah, let's go with that. And I don't think it starts at zero. I think it starts higher up. All right, you can move it up a little bit. And you can move, and how much these sliders make things happen, you can change. Right now it's set for a tenth of a point to move it around. All right, um, and you can dampen the curve. You can kind of, you know, make it a little steeper, damp. You can screw with these numbers. And you just monkey around with the levers until you go, ah, I feel good about that. <laughs> I, I kind of think that represents what I'm trying to get at. Likewise here, you can play around with these, uh, what's called the magnifier, the amplifier variable and a reducer variable. And what you're basically doing with these is you're saying, look, um, that's the yellow line that disappeared. If the players have a function that allows them uh, that there's a base value, but they can do something to make, make the curve uh, to amplify the effect or re to reduce the effect, you can see what that would be. When you're finally happy kind of with this little curve you've been playing with, right up here at the top of the thing, it tells you, well, this is the formula, right? If that's what you've been me messing around with and now you somehow think that that's right, right? And again, I'm not validating anything here. You think that's right. Well, there's the formula, right? Y equals X over uh, 0 0.15 raised to the power of 0 0.22 plus 69 times the 3.4 divided by 7.5. That's what it is. You can reduce that a little bit. Um, and in Excel, over here, you see that there's the Excel version of that same formula based on this little data table right here. Okay? That's all this does is it helps you try to rapidly figure out if I have to use, if I want to use Excel and I want to start trying to apply mathematical function to stuff, then I'll have to start to find function. And if I don't, and, and if I don't know it, if I can't look it up someplace else in somebody else's work, if I have some, at least some gross ideas about how the world might work, I can at least go to the, math, the marvelous math machine and pluck off the function. Now you can do that for um, logistic, you know, logarithmic rather, uh, logarithmic functions, logistic functions, quadratics, linears, we already talked about it, a little bit, asymptotics, et cetera, S-curves, you can play with S-curves. And the last function on the marvelous math machine says, what if you wanna put them in a combo platter? What if you wanna say, okay, look, I think one part of my problem behaves in a linear fashion, but another part of my problem behaves um, in a more quadratic fashion. So I want the net result of, of a linear and quadratic relationship together. All right, well, the tool will tell you, we'll show you what that looks like anyways, and you can make a plot out of it. So here I've called up for my first formula, I, I, linear, which means it's using the linear page, whatever I did on the linear page is now using. Um, and we'll say right now we've got no function here selected. So it's just a blank. All right, All right. so over here, there it is. There's a linear function based on whatever it is you created on the linear page. Now you say, I want that linear function to be the, the input to a quadratic function. There's a quadratic function, okay? So now the, it's the quadratic function of the linear function, okay? F2 of, you know, F of one of, of F2 down here, okay? All right, and you can say, what's that look like? What happens, well, here's just the quadratic part, the orange line, okay? And you put the two of them together, you get the gray line. That's what would result if you took that linear data and stuffed it inside of a quadratic formula, that's the curve you would get. Now, if you don't want it to be a function of a function, you want like take the linear output and add it to the quadratic output, so to speak, when you just pick, you put the plus uh, symbol there. So it's linear plus quadratic, gets you the gray line. If I can turn off the other two, there, there, that's the result of adding the linear function to the quadratic function. And again, if you go, yeah, looks about right. I think that would work for my game. Well, there you go. Then there you've got your formula. Okay, you've got the beginnings of some sort of math relationship you can monkey with, right? So again, this is really a, a simply a tool to help you represent information uh, in a way that's somewhat consistent, that you don't have some other way to do it, right? Not everything is solved in an Excel spreadsheet, right? Sometimes it's a deck of cards, a pair of dice, whatever, right? But that just shows you how, um, if, again, if you, if you don't remember your math, you can just rely on the marvelous math machine to at least get you started and get you something uh, close. This is now, the marvelous math machine then was done to, to, to make this thing. We had a problem of trying to consistently represent societies um, in war games where you thought that the populace had an impact on the political decision makers, right? 
Um, because don't, typically we don't have a cell of those people. Is someone representing the populace? And what, what shapes the populace's opinion? And how, how does that work exactly? Right? And so you're usually bringing in subject matter experts. We'll try to tell you that, well, if the government of Thailand were to do that, um, you could expect the, this type of reaction from the folks on the street, which is a, a fine way to do it. All right. The problem was always finding an expert in the region we were interested in and then dealing with, okay, well, this is so what? Okay, that's nice that you say there, there's a, a popular uprising in Thailand. All right, yeah, and does it have an impact on the game? What makes it matter? So uh, based on some work that Rand did in this national will to fight, um, they identified factors, contexts, and mechanisms. Okay, right here, factors, contexts, and mechanisms uh, that in their work, they believe uh, would influence uh, this national will to fight, which is not to be confused with public support. Those are different things. So based on that, and using the marvelous math machine, I threw together a model. And let's see if we can get the thing to load. There it is. And um, we'll hide that a little bit. Okay, so basically the, the national will to fight has its own little briefing buried inside of it. It explains the way the model is trying, what the model is trying to work, right? And so it talks about what exactly is national will to fight? What is public opinion? How are they different? Um, on the over here, as you move, you can see it's all color coded. The factors that are shaping a government's decision to fight to continue to stop, the context in which this has to play out, and the mechanisms that can be pulled, decisions that can be made to try to influence that. Okay, um, and then uh, we had to now talk about though, though it's got to matter, all right? Because otherwise, we call this window dressing. It's nice you have this marvelous model and it makes these pretty pictures or makes a clever bar graph, but if the players look at it and go, yeah, so what? Is it impacting their ability to achieve the objective set before them in the game? If the answer is no, and it's just there for richness and texture, well, no, nobody cares, all right? It's curious, it's fun, but nobody really cares. And they start to ignore it, right? Because they're realizing it's not impacting anything. So this tried to use saying, whatever you use this tool for, you have to eventually connect it to something that matters in the, in the context of gameplay. Right? And that's this idea here that, yeah, you can start off with some pretty low end reactions to stuff, okay? But as things get, as pu if public support falls going down the page, right? Uh, and things are getting worse going across the page, then ultimately you can end up with, you know, state intervention, police and paramilitary actions, et cetera, that have to then translate to something that we have over here in the columns as examples. And so for example, in the type of war game that I would be involved with, we could sit there and say that, that the, the Arab street is upset about US presence in Saudi Arabia conducting operations in the region. That's nice, they're upset, okay, who cares? If that upset then influences the Saudi government to withdraw US basing rights in Riyadh, suddenly the US player now is keenly interested in the Arab street because it just got connected to something he cares about, okay? So how do we then represent the Arab street in a way that's not arbitrary? That's what this tool was meant to get at, right? So it, has, it gives you the opportunity here to sit there and first it'll handle up to five countries that you can sit here and look, you should recognize across right across there, it looks like the marvelous math machine. There were things like government type, national identity, conflict, tolerance, and economic resiliency were the, some of the things that the RAND said he had identified. Therefore, I put them in this model. And really, it's all about relative relationships. It's not about absolutes. So in this case, you can sit there and say, country blue, whatever, whatever country blue is up here in the upper left-hand corner, you can say, well, they're a pretty, they're a pretty liberal democracy. So you can go and set this little slider way over here compared to country red, which is pretty authoritarian, or, or are they some sort of ruling, ruling uh, party kind of deal, coalition in the middle, or a, 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 a monarchy, constitutional monarchy. But you gotta figure out where, fits on this authoritarian democratic scale. And it has a little description down here about how that matters, okay? So actually the ends don't matter as much as the middle does, okay? Uh, in terms of this, this issue about how society responds. National identity, very cohesive society, uh, or is it a pretty dispersed, uh, a lot of diverse uh, opinions, groups, economics, uh, races, et cetera. That's gonna affect how they party or how the populace reacts in terms of using more cohesive societies are more supportive, okay? That's the premise that's in some of the RAND work. So again, you consider and dial in numbers to try to make these, these countries. Having done so then, there's a page that now lets you get into political messaging. It still takes a SME to sit there and say, well, based on what Blue is doing in the game, internally versus external support, I think internally their message um, would be well received 
screen, well received by the, the ruling side of the house, okay? And the, and the kind of the, 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 the elite part of the society, uh, high-end businesses and people involved. Um, and we have a part here where it describes who could that be. But somebody, the tool's not gonna tell you this, somebody's gonna have to tell you about how you think this message is resonating um, with the general populace, okay? What's, what's the word out there with the red based on what blue is saying? Um, are you pissing off people? Uh, ooh, red. And you can see down here, there's just a big little bar graph that kind of tries to show you a relative scale of support across government, defense communities, and the general populace for the five countries. Positive support above, negative support below. You can play with this. And all this is trying to start to do is get people to think in a consistent fashion and a consistent representation of how the messaging part, the political part is working. Economics, here, you can run these sliders. Is green relative to blue? Is blue, is, is blue hammering green with punitive economic sanctions? Well, the effectiveness of this is gonna be a function of how robust green's economy is. Remember that, we set that slider earlier. So now we get in this applied versus perceived pressure, a mapping of the economics of it. And you can run these around again, based on what's happening in the gameplay. This is the scariest one, is this idea right here on the military portion of it, in terms of, okay, so how confident are, is my populace that my military is gonna carry the day? And how, what's my attitude towards death and casualties, all right? Uh, both of my own and the adversary, all right? And basically each one of these boxes, and you can link them together, sort of blue is fighting red, then the red box and the blue box are tied together. You don't have to try to replicate the information. But the idea here is, you set this four slider scale. What are the stakes involved? Is this just adventurism? And quite frankly, if we win or lose, no one really cares. It's just some, it's, it's not our national security is not existence. Our very life as a country is not being threatened. All right, that would be pretty high, existential threat, okay, way up here. Uh, how confident am I in my military? You can run this slider around, okay? And you can see this big blue bar moving, all right? And basically what that starts to do is, if you're in the upper left quadrant, you're very hawkish. If you're below it in the lower right quadrant, you're dovish, okay, in terms of you think the populace is going to go along with this military operation or not. And then you can do the same thing with about tolerance in terms of how tolerant are you for killing the adversary? Remember, we, we have a, a, you know, the mechanism of demonizing the enemy, of making them less than human, right, allows a populace, at least mentally, to accept far more casualties on the adversary's side because they're somehow less than us, and I'll tolerate more of them dying, all right? So, what, what is the perception of society towards the other people, okay? And then what are you taking for your own casualties? And depending upon where those intersections of these four lines fall, it then spits out down here little statements based on how close you're getting to the boundary of flipping from being hawkish to dovish or vice versa. Again, this is kind of based off of that RAND work. And I made four, and there's one of these for every one of the countries that this little often can look at. So having done all that, it then you can look and it takes all those factors together and says, well, then this is kind of what you're starting to see, that based on where I just threw the levers, most of the military supports whatever it is you're trying to do, Blue. Um, your international support's getting a little softer. Uh, but your popular support, um, it's a little not quite as good as your military support, but it's still, you, most of your bar is more red than green. And I can have a subject matter expert say, I, I think this is wrong. Yeah, there's something's override it. You click the override function, and you can put, put the bar wherever your expert thinks the bar ought to be. Okay. But now you're going to have to then put in your own little statement down here because it will spit out some standard text language that reflects where it thinks the bars ought to go. Okay. Uh, all of that then gets dumped into a little infographic you can print and hand your players. Right. And again, the only value to this, again, it's not predicting what the Arab street's gonna do in a conflict, uh, in some future conflict. It is trying to show in a consistent fashion, identifying the relevant factors, how things are going over time and how that might be influencing them. And then the players have to decide how it influences them. I can't say in a game, hey, a blue government, you are afraid. I can't tell the players to feel anything. The players will feel and perceive what they feel and perceive. This is just meant to be a way to kind of show them in a consistent fashion how it might matter. And up here, it shows all that, you know, as you do this over time, it makes a little bar, a little line graph showing uh, blue approval ratings in terms of the military, the international public opinion. That part right here shows the instantaneous snapshot. And then it pulls and puts all this down here in, there we go, uh, in, Little, the little little graphs and it makes a nice little handout that you can then post on the game website or, or distribute to the game cells 
that starts to show uh, a pattern over time and begins to inform how this soft thing called the public is responding in the course of the game and how that might be tied to something you care about, overflight rights, basing access, et cetera. Right? So that was all came about by using the Marvel's math machine. All right, so now the last thing we're gonna talk about is the process called gold posting, um, which is, I think, a, is a very handy way to create combat result tables when, quite frankly, you don't know how to create, you, you don't know how to do it. I mean, in terms of you don't have the information necessarily at hand to do this, um, or you need an easy way to represent it because you don't have the time in your game to have a 20 minute discussion between anti-submarine warfare experts to figure out whether or not the diesel submarine got hit or not. And you need something a little faster and funnier. All right, so this is a call to process called gold posting. Uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Dave Ward, came up with this uh, uh, quite some time ago uh, as a way to try to do just that. What are the left and right lateral limits of something uh, and how then is the football going through the uprights of a goalpost pushed towards the left or pushed towards the right um, in terms of, of success, All right? So with that, there we go. Um, you're going to identify a situation you want to goalpost and you're going to put it in the form of a statement that starts off with the likelihood that mm, what? The likelihood that a P-8 successfully prosecutes a kilo submarine would be an example of a military one. Um, then you're going to try to figure out what are all the potential factors, very brainstormy activity here, what are all the potential factors that would influence the success of that statement, meaning that the P-8 gets the sub or the failure of that statement, meaning the P-8 doesn't get the sub. And you always do this from one guy's perspective. In this case, in that, that case, I'm taking it from the P-8's perspective. Success from that is success for the P-8, not success for the diesel. But that would be a failure for the P-8. And then you're going to put them on what's called a goalpost plot. Now, I'll show you a tool, then I'll give you actually some little numbers you can play with. So what are we going to do? We're going to do a little, little thought exercise. Okay. So our first statement we're going to play with, is the purpose of our demo here, is this idea of the likelihood that a zombie horde will successfully overrun my house. Okay, that's our, that's our thought problem. Uh, and we need a combat result table that reflects this. So that if I'm playing this game and zombies attack my house, what's gonna be the outcome? How, how do I figure this out, right? So in doing this type of thing, I said, first thing you do is you're gonna try to think of factors that influence the likelihood of a zombie horde taking over my house, right? And zombie numbers. Okay, I'm thinking that probably the more zombies there are, the more successful they're gonna, the chances are of them being over, able to overrun my house. So you can start doing this with all sorts of ideas about the number of defenders, the barricades, how long the attack lasts, all these other factors. These are stuff I just sat down and, you know, in, in 30 seconds kind of scribbled on a piece of paper, right, that I could think of that would influence the success of a zombie attack on my home. Now, so that's the first thing you're gonna do. For whatever it is you're trying to goalpost, you're gonna generate these ideas. Having generated those ideas, you're gonna look at each one now and say, okay, well, hang on. Do some of these need to be, be massaged a bit or we need to be, get some better understanding for what we're trying to get at? Uh, and if we take these first two and we say zombie numbers and the defender numbers, um, and I just said, well, it's less about the absolute numbers as it is the ratio of how many people I have in my home defending it versus how many zombies are attacking. So that was the first modification I made was, I created this ZD ratio. Instead of calling it zombie numbers, defender numbers, I made one factor called the ZD ratio. Okay? So then I looked at for binary factors. This idea that, okay, time of day, yeah, but what about time of day? That doesn't tell me enough to use it in a combat table. So time of day. So I said, well, it's day versus night. Okay, that's binary. And I can't have both conditions exist at the same time. So pick one, All right? In this case, I decided that since I'm, I'm building this from the zombies perspective, Night is better for the zombies, right? Because it is, right? It's harder for me to see them. They're not as reliant on, on light to, to detect me. So night's better for the zombies. So I'll change time of day. I'll set that card aside. And now I'll use a card called night attack. You keep doing this, right? Weapon type. Okay, that's a little, well, what about weapons? Okay, it turns out that I, I need more than just weapon types. And I, as we thought about it, well, there's, there's like families of weapons. They all seem to kind of fit together. So there's firearms, uh, edged or blunt weapons, and then flamethrowers. And somebody said, well, okay, flamethrower, that's nice, but I don't have a flamethrower. It's not in the scope of the game. Yes, it could be an awesome weapon for fighting zombies, um, might have unintended consequences depending upon where a burning zombie walks to, um, 
but I don't have flamethrowers. But, but I could make Molotov cocktails. I got rags, I got bottles, I got gasoline. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll put in Molotov cocktails. I have to do the same kind of logic thought think through with the kind of house. Well, what about the kind of house? Single story, is that the issue? Single story, multi-story brick versus a, a, a trailer, what? Um, barrier status is a little vague. I mean, so we talked about bars in the window, steel doors, a moat, a fence, what? What do we exactly mean? So we're gonna flesh out the ones we need to flesh out a little bit more, and we're gonna restate them as these sentences, right? So our ZD, our ZD ratio now becomes a, a statement that impacts the likelihood of success. Z, zombie defender ratio of 101 or greater increases the likelihood of zombies over in my house. A night attack increases the likelihood they're over in my house. Defending with firearms decreases the likelihood the zombies are over in my house. You get the idea. So you're going to rewrite each of the factors now as this phrase that has a direct connection to the likelihood of my base statement, the likelihood that zombies over in my house. And I'm going to take these and I'm going to sort them. If it's pro-zombie, if it increases the likelihood of the base statement, you put it to the right side of your whiteboard if you're using post-it notes and whiteboards, which is the way I do these when I do these exercises. Put them to the right. And if it decreases, go to the left. Now you're going to sort them again, top to bottom. And basically what you're going to say is, look, there are certain factors here that while we say yes, they do influence the outcome of the event, I don't have much control over it in the game that I'm, I'm visualizing that we, we looked at playing. It does influence, but I don't have much control. So if in the game, I can't change the nature of my house, right, or, or all the houses in the game are single story houses, it, it matters, but I can't control. It. So boom, goes down to the bottom. Likewise with the bars on, on if, if in the game, I can't increase my barricading, if I have what I have, at the time of the attack, the game has no way for me to add bars to the windows if I didn't already have them installed. Um, I can't swap out my door in the middle of the game from my hollow core door to a steel door. Then I have what I have. In military contexts, this is often where things like ship resiliency end up living. Ship resiliency has an impact on how well it's going to absorb a hit, how much armor it has, double hull, torpedo blisters, compartmentalization. Those are all factors in ship design that make them more or less resilient. I can't control it though. It may vary from boat to boat, but I have no control over it. And if I'm building this for a destroyer versus a battleship, maybe I need different tables. But if it's a destroyer, it is what it is. That goes below the line. So I've now done that sort. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna further sort them. And within a quadrant, we're gonna rack and stack them uh, prioritized. So the most important thing that I'm going to, I think, is going to go to the top of my list up here, up high, so up here. And the more of an of a influence I think it has, the further away from centerline it goes. I put it way out there. So if I think the ZD ratio is the thing, really, that's going to have the most impact on the outcome of this statement, I put it up and right in that quadrant. Okay, then everything else becomes relative to that. So night attack, rate, if that's where ZDD ratio is, about where's the relative position of night attack? Where's the relative position of surprise? Okay, how much does that single story contribute? So, so you do the same thing with all these. All right, you, you rack and stack them and line them up, all right? That's a goalpost plot. This is, okay, so Peter, how's that still, I'm still not there yet. I, I, how's that help? Ah, here's what we do next. Now we take those relative positions and we put them into my goalposting tool. All right, the goalposting tool uh, is a spreadsheet. It's just Excel, it's made to look pretty. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna match, uh, the center of the, of the tool has these sliders and you're gonna match the sliders to the position of those post-it notes on your board. You're gonna write down over here what those things were. ZD defender, night attack, surprise, firearms, fire, blunt weapons, right? Up here's your key statement, right? The steel doors, the single story house. You're gonna add all that to the, to the tool, right? And based on what you've just, where you've put those sliders, and I'll show you the actual one where the numbers come from, it will generate a little table, a gold posted table that you can print out and stuff in a notebook for an adjudicator to use, for a player to use, for you to use, right? As you look at your uh, design. And it, what it shows you is not dissimilar to the information for all you Dungeons and Dragons fans that would have been in a combat table that says, look, the base chance of me, if, I, if I've got to fight this orc, the, best, the base chance for getting a hit on this orc is I get 17, I need to roll a 17 or better. Unless I'm using a, a broadsword or a battle axe, which gives me a plus two. Um, on the defensive side, 
um, if I've got mithril armor on, that'll reduce his counterattack. If I've got iron armor on, actually, that's not so great. All right, the mithril armor is much better. It, it's adjusters to a base event. Those of you familiar with matrix gaming, okay, this is, again, not dissimilar to the idea that you establish a base likelihood of something occurring, and then people make arguments why it should be better or why it should be worse. Goal posting is just doing this in advance. That's all this is, is doing that argument in advance. And hopefully you can gather up some zombie experts who can help you build this type of chart. So now what it's telling you is based on what you plugged in the front page, the base chance of success is 49%. The best it can be for the zombies, best case scenario for the zombies, 76%. Worst case for the zombies, 24%. And if these factors are present, if you're defending with firearms, you ought to subtract 13 points off of the base. If you're defending with fire, you can subtract another seven points off of the base. But if the zombies come at night, you better add seven points onto the base. Okay, the digital version of this just does it in real time. And then if you want, it'll roll a die for you and tell you whether you had success or failure, right? So real quick, let's look at the goal poster. And you can, you can make this for anything, right? Anything you can conceptualize and put into that probability statement, you can build a little table for. And I'll show you why that's important here in a second. Um, so here it is, the, the, um, the sliders have already been positioned to be in the same position as they were on our, our, our zombie example. Whoops, let me go back one. Um, and, oh, I see what it did. Uh, hang on. We, I, I inadvertently closed our, oh, there it is, it's back. Closed from all, I wanted to reduce stuff for you. Okay, so you can see a little better. The sliders in position. I got my zombie horde statements in. I filled in the blanks. The, the other ones are just placeholder words that are normally there in the, in the tool. Now, the numbers. Turn on show starting values. When I do these exercises, I don't show people the numbers to start because they get, they get wrapped up in the numbers and not thinking about the factors and their relative influence. And they all want to look at the numbers instead. So we do the positioning first. Then we say, okay, based on our subject matter understanding of the problem, what's our baseline probability that the zombies are going to be successful? And if you can't give me an answer, it's 50%. This is the magic in, in matrix gaming. It's seven or better with two die. In my combat table, it's 50-50 unless you can make a case for why it should be something for the baseline. Then you can say, worst day, best day, okay? What do you think the very bottom could be, all right? And I, and I tell people, it's never zero, and the best theoretical is never one, all right? Because life is not quite that certain. There's gotta be some slop in there. So usually, yeah, I let people go up maybe 95% on this end and 5% of that end. And you can click on these and they give you a little, you know, really bad day, a little explanatory and what number you can put in there. But then it's also gonna ask you, um, those things you can't monkey with really, they just are. And we're not gonna address them in the game explicitly as something that is or isn't because you have no control over it. It's just a function of the table you're using. How much do those things matter, right? And it's this idea of the max penalty percentage. And again, you can click on these things and they'll sit you and tell you kind of the range you ought to think about using. Once you play with those numbers, then you can sit there and say, well, show me what that nine works out to. Well, there's our numbers, our 24 and our 49 and our 76. That's where that came from. If you had said that I think this is more like 0.45%, okay, well then it'll recalculate it and says, well, now your numbers look more like 22, 44, and 73, if that's what you're working with. And it'll sit there and show you then the percentage if you wanna see the percentage adjustments that are being used on this page before you end up going to this page. And there you go. And based on what I have selected right now, defending with fire, you know, what I put on the front page, defending with firearms and night surprise is 39% chance of success for the zombies, Roll a random number, it, it, the zombies failed. Woo! Well, my home is safe for another roll of the die. Okay, I just rolled the dice again. God ah, damn, didn't work out so good that time. The zombies overran my house. Okay, I'm, I'm pressing F9 and it's just re-rolling the die each time. Um, you can, if you're curious to see what this looks like over multiple trials, they can sit there and tell you that, okay, so if all you do is look at the base value, uh, out of 12 trials, you've got five successes. You can put in like 16,000. It's just a limit of Excel, how big of a number you can stick in here. Um, but if you're curious that if the, um, if they always attack at night and by clicking over here, it turns that feature on for all trials and they're only successful um, they'll be, and given the numbers you have in the front, 40% and all, they're successful to, uh, three times out of 12. I mean, you can always keep re-rolling. It's just statistical crunchy. Ooh, seven times out of 12, five times out of 12. Okay. I mean, you just keep doing this. The reason I had this page in here is to, again, that, that check, just like you were monkeying around in the marvelous math machine to say, does this look right? Does it kind of 
fit my expectations for my understanding of the problem. Well, likewise here, if you go and you run a P8 versus a diesel submarine problem, and the output is like, yeah, boy, that my, my, I think my subject matter expertise tells me that the sub would get away more often than not, yet this thing has the P8 killing it 80% of the time. Okay, well, you need to go back and monkey with it to get better numbers. This is not predictive. It is simply explanatory. And the value of having done all this, you said, why do all this? All right. Why don't you just let my subject matter experts do it? Well, that's true. You can do that. Okay. But by kind of constructing this four quadrant plot, that yeah, four quadrant plot, you're starting to make things much more explicit for everybody involved. Okay. And so that now you can have everybody understand the relevant actions and the magnitude to which they'll influence the outcome of events. I find that there's nothing more frustrating in a game where we're relying 100% on subject matter experts on a subject that quite frankly has a wide variety of opinion. And I've got my expert down in adjudication, but I got another expert up in the blue cell. And quite frankly, I now have, what's, have the opportunity for what's called SME on SME violence, okay? Because the guy downstairs thinks that the relevant factor for the problem that they're adjudicating is all about acoustics. And the other guy upstairs thinks it's all about water depth. And although the two are related, it's a little bit different in how you approach your operational parameters and your likelihood of success. So I got people who are considering two different, very different functions that are influencing their decision-making in the course of the game. And somebody's going to be frustrated because things aren't working out as anticipated. Even if it's a low end, again, with that Dungeons and Dragons example, I can be upset that the orc squashed me, but at least I understood that I only had a one chance in eight of being successful. I threw the die and saw the number. I could have made it better than one in eight. I could have taken actions to improve my odds, but I said, I'll take my chances or this is the best I can do. I got what I got. Goal posting creates a measure of transparency and gives the players a sense of what they should be considering and not wasting their time monkeying with factors that your model or your SMEs aren't prepared to adjudicate. That's the power of that, okay? The last thing I'm going to do, last uh, couple, six, five, six minutes here, we're just going to do a quick survey. So you can create all sorts of these things. I mean, this is my air-to-air -air calculator. Um, you can sit there and, and pick two types of aircraft uh, and, and send uh, uh, 20 F-22s against 30 J-20s and arm them up with different missiles. It'll do a three-turn dogfight. Um, it'll do one at range, beyond visual range. It'll do a mid-range fight. Then it'll go into a visual fight with heaters. Um, and it'll tell you how many weapons get fired and how many people got shot down. Right? And it's just, a, it's, it's really a glorified probability machine uh, is all it is using salvo models and um, cumulative probabilities. Um, it also has a part in there where it'll make this pretty little detectograph thing where it'll sit there and tell you who's detecting who based on radar cross sections. So you can get into stealth type stuff. Um, and this is all stuff I pulled open source. So this, uh, this uh, stuff wasn't classified. Um, and it'll show you how these planes will fly closer to each other over time and who's detecting who. Okay. So like in this little model right now, you can see the F-22 um, it's got it's doing 300 knots of uh, closure on the um, this J20, or no, I'm sorry, he's doing 500 knots, he's doing 300 knots, so 800 knots of closure. Um, and the, uh, the F22 is painting the J20, that's this darker air in the radar band. The F22 is also painting the bomber behind the F22. The J20, I'm sorry, the, the J20 doesn't see the F22 radar cross direction stuff at that range at those speeds. But that's what that toy does, okay? Um, my amphibious landing calculator. And as you can imagine, all of these were built because I had a game that needed them. Right? Not because I was just bored. <laughs> right? So they're all very purposely built for a particular set of game parameters. All right, this one here, um, amphibious landing calculator. We built this one because we were having problems in a previous game where people were saying, oh, I don't think you could get that many troops ashore in that amount of time. So this is just a, a, a logistics machine that says, um, given a capacity, given a distance, given a speed of transport, how many back and forth trips can I make? And you can sit here and put in all sorts of things about, are they sailing all at once? Are they sailing in convoy? Are they doing a conveyor pattern? Um, is there delay because there's only 10 piers to onload, but there's 20 ships, so 10 have to wait? It does all that. And it'll spit you out a table. They'll sit there and tell you, hey, if it's 135 miles to the objective area and you've got 20 uh, LSTs, this is how many trips you could make and this is how many troops will get across. Now, suddenly, everyone's more, much more attuned to the capacity of the adversary to land enemy forces. The connector time was because we did a game where I needed to get down into the noogies of just those little LCACs, right? The, the landing cushion aircraft or the, um, the uh, 
LCUs, landing craft utilities, and moving, you know, when a ship can't just go up to the beach or go up to the pier and you're using little boats to go back and forth, how long does it take to get guys off and bring people back? That's what this calculator was for. It's not a, is it a model? Yeah, I guess, but it's a calculator that just does some back of the napkin math for you that is faster than you trying to wing it, okay? The detectomatic sat there and you could put in the probability of radars or sensors, it's just sensors, seeing different things. You define the things, you define the sensors, you plug in baseline probabilities for detection, you plug in counters to it, and it'll sit there and run a bunch of checks to see if or not the sensor you're employing under the conditions you're employing, it does or doesn't find the ship. And in, like here in the example right here where you can see the results are down the middle here. Um, what I've got here, uh, the ship is apparently, or whatever, that was the target. Uh, it's a large type of ship, so large ship, in MCON, no jammers being employed, uh, no laser counters for dazzling, but night is a factor. So you can see MCON on all the time. There's the night windows, that's the red windows. And down here, I, I get a satellite looking. Those are satellite looks, radar looking, and humans, right? Human intelligence looking. And the ones are where only one sensor hits. In this particular rule, in this particular game, you need two sensor hits to be a good, uh, good hit for the adversary, one sensor alone. So it had to be crossed with another sensor. And you can see in hour 14, it looks like the radar picked up the large ship and human would have reported the same large ship. Two hits, uh, now the enemy can take action. Detect <laughs> Casualty calculator, another quick calculator because we were getting into things about people asking about how many people were injured and go, why do you care? There's no medical part of this game. There's no crew and evacuation part of this game. There's no CASAVAC, why do you care? Somebody cared. Okay, so we built a casualty tool. Um, not dissimilar to what the actual medical community uses. Now, I've had some docs use it and to say, well, you know, you're using a lot of the same information we're using. This is just based on historical data and Coast Guard data based on guys in the water. How long is the people in Navy, right? So I care about how long guys can stay in the water, right? So the casualty calculator. Um, my little epidemic model, this was what, it was the core. I'll take, we'll take a quick look at this. Um, this is, uh, again, a simple model that sits there and plays out susceptible infected recovered uh, uh when people talk about flattening the curve during COVID-19 this is what they were talking about on the example you see right here in front of you is imagine a small mid-sized college campus and some uh, you know isolated land grant kind of like uh, uh, now again it's a place in the midwest say they got 15,000 students one student shows up with the measles this is why college campuses are really freaking out about measles one kid shows up with the measles and nobody's got no one's been vaccinated for the measles inside of 20 days you're gonna have 9,000 kids infected. You'll have a peak infection of 14,000 of those kids out of the 15 are gonna get infected and, and uh, 30 will die, right? Based on these sorts of numbers. Um, and you can sit there and say, well, good grief, that's bad. Yes, it is bad. Measles are wicked infectious, by the way. Low mortality rate, wicked infectious. So if instead you say, hey, um, vaccinate the vaccination here, uh, let's say at least 75% of the kids were vaccinated and the vaccine itself is about 80% effective in preventing the measles. Boom. Wow. Look how it changes the graph. Okay. It wickedly flattens the curve. Um, your peak now doesn't occur until day, where's the peak? I'm going to run this little tool. Or, uh, peak occurs somewhere in day 40. Yeah, there you go. About day 46 it peaks. Um, and now you're only looking at a, at a peak infection rate of uh, 1,700 kids that are six out of 1,800, uh, and you're going to have 5,600 total infected. SAR models, these have been around forever. A lot of limitations. They don't work in super large populations. It assumes a lot of things like uniform mixing of the people. Okay, that's why you can't put in 325 or 350 million and make it model the United States, right? Because we don't uniformly mix, right? But that's a tool, Excel, right? It's a little quickie Excel tool uh, that I threw together. And that's what started the whole contagion model uh, right there. All right, and I think we got uh, one more. Oh, generic engagement things. I mean, this is where... I, I build these because either I don't want to spend time rolling dice or I have people who freak out when they see me rolling dice. I have senior officers that come into my adjudication cell and when they see me rolling dice as part of an adjudication process, they freak out because they think dice rolling is somehow arbitrary. I always have to point out to them that dice rolling is simply a random number generating process. It's the number I'm looking for you ought to be, you ought to be, concer you ought to be concerned about, okay? So um, the fact that I'm rolling 0.7 you know, the, the, wrong, once having decided that there's a 0.7 chance of success, rolling my 100 side die and looking for numbers below 70 on the die is perfectly fine. It's how did I come up with 70? That's what you should be quizzing me about. All this does is give you a quick way to go and, and uh, map, uh, but you have to preload it with some probabilities for hit between different weapon systems and different type of platforms and it'll quickly run an answer for you. This is really just a shorter form of this one here, which is the last thing we have, which is called the binomial distributor. 
um, which does not presuppose that it's weapon system paired. It doesn't know what it is you're talking about. And we'll look at this as the last model. Um, what it does is simply take, and you tell it, the probability of success. So whatever it is, whatever we're talking about is 60%. We're going to try 10 times, okay? Uh, whatever 10 means. It, it, we're going to roll 10 die, and we're looking for 60s or better, or, or, uh, or under the 60s uh, for success. And then if you can imagine that I'm going to apply the successes across some number of bins, right? So if you can imagine, this is looks sort of like beer pong. I've got these containers. I'm throwing dice. The dice are landing in some containers, and some of those dice are hits, and some of those dice are misses, success or fails. What's the distribution, right? But that's all this does. Now, you can put your own spin on it and say, well, what if it's a missile, it's 10 salvos with a 60% chance of hit targeting three ships, okay? What do I get? Okay, well, here's the result, all right? And it'll, it'll keep re-rolling if I keep pressing F9. So it, you got three successes. The distribution curve tells you what you should have expected. So you can see that you are kind of uh, uh, in a quote unquote more rare outcome that you only got three uh, if it was 60 out of 10. Um, and of the three buckets that you had, three ships that you had laid out, it looks like ship two randomly sucked up one hit and ship three randomly sucked up two. If you don't want to use just random distribution across these, you can change how many bins there are. Um, you can also change this to what's called a weighted distribution and go to the weighted page and sit there and go, okay, so increase the probability. If I still have three things, let's say that one of those things is an aircraft carrier. I think aircraft carriers are four times more likely to get hit than the, than, than the escorting destroyer. So destroyer, carrier, destroyer. It gives me some points to throw out there four times. And now when I go back, oh, look, it tends to distribute more hits to the carrier because I weighted it that way. Um, you can also use cumulative probabilities um, in terms of needing the probability of zero successes of exactly the number or up to that number. Um, because in some case, you're more interested in the cumulative success than you are in any individual success. The tool does all that. Um, it's just, and this is just prob stat. This is what I should have paid attention more to when I've had prob stat in college. Uh, and finally, it does some probable events. If you want to do an and, and event or an and, or event, what are the probability of this and that, or the probability of this or that, it has a quickie down there for you to just kind of throw those numbers in. That's all it does, okay? Um, so that was just a quick survey of all the sorts of tools that you can construct uh, that help you with your gaming, either from a design perspective where you're trying to see, I, I just, I, I need to understand some relationships. I want to make some models just to see to make sure that I've got some of the major muscle movements of the game tuned about right. Um, so things being able to give to players to say, look, you should be aware that in this game, this is how X affects Y, play accordingly. And for your adjudicators to have something to be able to sit there and go in a more consistent fashion that both the players and the adjudicators understand that these are the sorts of things that are going to push success or failure into what degree. All of that was Excel. Just sometimes I spend a lot of time making Excel look pretty. Okay, and that's that whole idea of the three-layer model. So, uh, we got the remainder of time for questions. Um, just chime up. You should be able to uh, unmute if you have a question, and it's just kind of like first to the microphone wins. Ooh, this is easy. Oh. Awesome. Yes, let me, I'll even give you a video. Hi. Hey. Uh, awesome. So, wow, obviously this is a ton of information. Yeah. Um, really interesting stuff. So I actually, my background, I did a PhD in modeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I loved it. I actually really enjoyed and appreciate your, your back to basics on modeling. I think you're underselling yourself. Like, um, especially a lot of the, you know, the really, so I actually I did a PhD in engineering as well. And so um, I, it's been a while since I've gotten like really excited about like kind of engineering type of stuff, which is what all of your tools are. Um, so I, I just want to say, yeah, I really appreciate kind of finding that nexus between these really practical and engineering type of applications and like, oh, this is how we can kind of tie some of this stuff in. Um, that really do that. So I'm from our Office of Advanced Analytics um, in CSO. So we do use some of these type of um, modeling approaches. Um, Definitely. I mean, I can ask you a bunch of questions in terms of, you know, how you're counting for like human behavior type of stuff, which is always the kind of the trickiest thing um, in these modeling. So certainly that we get that question a lot when we present on these. So I'd be interested in your opinion there. Um, and the other, the ones that we tend to be quite interested in and 
because he's certainly related, I think, to like the, the war game gaming stuff, which I have less of a background in, um, would be like the negotiation side. So that's, we do several um, negotiations models um, that have like less user-friendly interfaces than your stuff does. Uh, I, I appreciate the pretty layer. I just don't want to throw that out there. Um, super important and like, like, you need to have all the data underneath as well, but uh, people do appreciate I think a pretty model. Um, yeah, so the, the human part of it, um, mm -hmm. that's where usually what we have to do is, and that's why I did that that national will to fight problem because it was mm -hmm. a lot of human factor. Uh, mm -hmm. And having then to say, okay, for the purposes of this model, we're gonna assume that people are very tolerant until this point, and then they rapidly get irritated and they even more quickly go to violent action, All right? Well, that sounds like mm -hmm. steep kind of, you know, flat, flat, flat. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's an exponential curve. So let's just start with that and see where we go. And that's then we tell people, right now, we think that for the purpose of this model, general populace is gonna respond in an exponential fashion to these factors. Now, later someone can say, oh, you know, we studied the hell out of that. And it's not so exponential. O okay, tell me what it is. I'm happy to modify the model. And this has usually always been our approach to gaming to say, I'm not gonna argue with you in terms of the game says uh, because the game says what it says based on the rules in play if we argue about the rules great let's have an argument about the rules but if we're going to accept those rules then this is what the game spits out so i'm always happy to have people you know to go back mm -hmm. and think this is over as over stated or understated sure okay let's make a modification but then if that's mm -hmm. the world then you get what you get when we play right, right. Um, yeah, and some things just sometimes you often you just can't find a, a tidy Excel approach um, to address some of them. Again, like again, negotiation factors. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the courses my my wife teaches at URI, and she teaches business negotiations. And we get into these situations where there's you know implied payoffs, um, implied risk. Are you you know, and the problem with humans, right? We're we're more risk averse, loss averse than we are gain positive um, type of thing. Mm -hmm. We we overestimate the the pain of loss versus the the value of gain, and how do you put those in models? And I mean, it's always been a problem because ultimately somewhere along the line, someone qualitatively is gonna make an assessment and pick a number in. And this is always the joke we used to have when people would come to us and say, ah, our model includes the morale of the troops. And we go, lovely, how'd you, because well, we have a 10 point scale. And when the, you know, when the troop morale falls below seven, they'll drop back eight squares. And if it drops to four, they'll disperse. It goes, marvelous, where'd you get those numbers? we made them up <laughs> yes <Right. laughs> all right. right perfectly useful if people understand what makes a seven what makes a four and then the game can somehow then account for that and play to it so yeah a lot of the human stuff and that's why I oftentimes i try to avoid and that's why i said i can never tell the players how they feel and mm -hmm. players who have tried to do this in games where they'll sit there and out of the blue they'll say ah oh, we've started a propaganda campaign and the enemy's populace is now in the streets. I go, okay, hang on. <laughs> you, I'll let you come up with a propaganda campaign. How the enemy populace responds, you don't get to decide. And what other guys whose populace that represents, you know, the red populace, well, the red leadership in his cell gets to decide what he does about it and how he responds to it. I can't dictate the player's mental state or how he has to respond to it. Because as soon as I do that, the red player will come back and say, oh, that's bullshit. I would have sent in the secret police and I would have squashed it. So it would never happen. Now we're into this, my story is better than your story mm -hmm. contest, yeah. which I found myself in in a very public way in a large auditorium in the middle of a war game, which was uncomfortable. Um, that's why I, I prefer now to kind of give them, look, within this game, here are the parameters at play. Here are the things that matter. This is what you need to focus on. These are the ways and means available to get to the ends. Don't, don't, don't go outside of this. Um, It'd be interesting. We can talk about it in plenary if you want to go outside of those rules. But for the purpose of the game, please play inside the rules. If you're forcing in the box thinking, I'm forcing game thinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that, I think that's really interesting. Um, I think for us, we tend to be looking at kind of evaluating, you know, policy outcomes. Like here's a policy, what is going to be that happen and or how to make the best policy based on a set of um, yeah. scenarios, you know, of, of inputs. Um, but very like similar type of stuff. And I, I really like the approach and this is the transparency. I really liked your marvelous math machine. 
Yeah. Again, if I had paid attention in, in, in math, I would have had to use the marvelous math machine, but I was, I needed it. <laughs> yeah, I pay attention. I still need it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So, um, yeah, in your comment that, you know, complexity doesn't always make things better. It just like broke my heart, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate your slides and, and thank you for, for taking the time. So um, the, um, the Marvelous Math Machine, the binomial distributor, the combat, uh, the poster, the goal poster, and uh, for people who just like to play around with epidemic models, uh, the uh, SIRD model are all available, will be available mm -hmm. along the same place where we, we stick these uh, recordings. Mm -hmm. I've cool. seen so me have to get it from a you know, non-military computer for the time being, but uh, yeah. Pup, those are available. I've, I've uploaded them. If people want to play with the Marvelous Math Machine or whatever, have at it. Well, very cool. I, I think I actually will probably go check that out and poke around. And <laughs> the other thing I guess that we're kind of involved in as well as, as DARPA is looking, is working with DARPA on kind of a how to bring uh, these various types of approach, um, I guess not modeling approaches to like tabletop exercises. Mm -hmm. Um, so they're of course doing something big and fancy that I like sort of understand. Um, but looking at, you know, developing all the tools to do a lot of this data driven stuff, um, and then also explore the cause of modeling. Um, so something like, like a lot of, a lot of overlap stuff that we're real interested in. Yeah. So. yeah. And one of the things that we find that the players find frustrating and hence why I like things like the goal poster is that mm -hmm. you've given them a little bucket of things that they can do in the game. The model is using 150 things they can't influence in the game. And they don't understand why when they take action, they get some result. They can't see the, the connection between what they did and what happened in the gameplay. And not that the world is supposed to be necessarily transparent. There's stuff that happens all the time. We go, huh? Why'd that happen? Right? But in games environments, it rapidly gets frustrating. You got to walk a very fine line between introducing uh, ambiguity and complicating so that because players are struggling to find the right levers and frustrating to the point where they stop playing. We liken this to a very complex box that has a bunch of levers all over it and there's a little shoot at the bottom. And we tell the players, if you put all the levers in the right place, a piece of candy will come out, right? Well, if there's one lever, blink, I get a piece of candy. I, this is kind of boring. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's one lever, I got a piece of candy. I, I'm not very intrigued by this. Um, I give you a couple of three or four levers. and Maybe it takes you a little while to find the right combination. I give you a hundred levers. You'll never figure out how to do it. You'll get frustrated. And if a piece of candy does come out, you'll never be able to replicate what you did. So mm -hmm. why we, we like things that are a bit, a bit more transparent, even if it's artificially simplifying the problem, because again, why are you gaming? So you've always got to go back to what's the purpose your model is meant to support. How does that fit? All models are wrong, but some are useful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll let somebody else jump in, but yep. I just wanted to say thanks. That was, yeah, yep. really interesting and, and lots of food for thought. So thanks, Pete. Um, That's a great presentation. Uh, I very much enjoyed that and the presentation you gave on the um, on the contagion model at uh, on the Moles course um, back, back a few months ago, which I was taking. Uh, uh, I'm impressed with the, uh, this the your your um, the rapid results engine. Um, I mean, you drawing out the factors in advance to stack your probabilities so you actually know how you adjudicate is clearly a very important step forward. Many of the proponents for matrix games will say, well, you get your SMEs at the game to bring the factors out as you're playing, but you, you need all week to ha let them fight and argue and decide which ones really are important and which are the bigger factors and the smaller factors. So actually a different kind of game where you just want to be able to adjudicate on the fly, but you've actually engaged your SMEs, captured some input, and then created effectively the meta model of the SMEs perspectives. You've now got your canned sort of result generator and you can run much faster. And the comments you make um, that this resonates um, the, the, by making it plausible, you've got a model you can explain, you know what factors are in, you know what factors are not. Um, for the purpose of this game, this factor applies. The purpose of this game, that factor is out of bounds. We can come back later and you know, in play test, presumably you'll run into the factor you, that, that your little team forgot and somebody else says is critical, yeah. bring it back in, redo. And when you go live for the real game, um, you should have got all the right factors in there in the right order. Um, and then the game becomes plausible for everybody. So very impressive approach. I look forward to tinkering with the tools in due course. 
and, and thank you very much for bringing this all, all to us. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah, and that was exactly why we, we kind of did this in, in terms of, of um, we often said, well, let's just get some SMEs together ahead of time and make some tables. I go, okay, how are we going to do that? <laughs> what <Exactly>. do <laughs> so, hence the goalposting. Zach. Yes, uh, Pete, thank you very much. This was a fascinating introduction into the world of modeling. I had a, a broad question uh, for you, which is understanding that, of course, models are based on abstractions and that the more complex a problem uh, something is, the more abstraction is required. Are there certain problems, certain challenges that are just not appropriate for modeling, where a good modeling practitioner shouldn't get in the practice of trying to advocate a model-based solution? And, and what are those variables or criteria in which you would say, uh, no? Or is it really just about, you know, it's not about the problem. There are no problems that are off limits. It's about what level of abstraction you're comfortable with. Yeah, um, I guess it, it tends to be, yeah, the more of that latter because- you, Not to do it. In other words, based on the oh, notion, do no harm, right? In medicine or development or whatever, yeah. when is a modeling approach too risky to pursue as well? Thanks. Yeah. So. Um, and some of the things that, that Melissa started to talk about in terms of where it just gets hard to imagine and to and for what purpose, why would you do it, right, kind of thing to your thing about is model even appropriate um, to represent something. And that's why that very first part of my, my talk, I start off with saying, okay, so I've, I've already thought about the game in terms of who the players are um, and what decisions I think they're going to need to make in this game to be interesting. And within that, then uh, you have to do what's called the in do out approach in terms of, okay, so if I'm going to have you in this game and I'm going to ask you to make these sorts of decisions, then what information do I want you to have to make those decisions? What's your input for the activity that will result in a decision? And that decision is the output of your little game wit that become these little in do out midgets that we then assemble into a gameplay. And my output could be your input depending upon you know, what our role is in the game. So then I started asking myself, okay, so that input part, where are they gonna get that from? Now, if the answer is another player cell, okay. If, if I think humans are the best to provide that sort of input for you to make a downstream decision, then I'm gonna need some humans to do it. But at some point, I'm gonna run into the part, the, the problem of, okay, I now need apparently a thousand humans to play this game because every possible link in my, my chain of events has another human involved. And now I'm running into practical problems in terms of, of I can't have that many people play. Um, I have a classification problem. My space isn't big enough. But, so at some point, I have to draw a box around this flow chart of in do out models and figure out that that's the boundary where I want people to participate and use you know, people-driven information. Outside of that box, I now have to go, all right, so what do I need? What do I, that's where I started thinking about, is there a model spot out there someplace? In combat games, it's always relatively easy to understand because we know that short of getting into a game that starts to look more like an exercise where I'm not going to have people sitting in simulators, right, driving around uh, computers to do the, the naval battle part of this problem. Odds are I'm going to run into a model at that level. I'm going to have humans that represent certain echelons of command, but at some point, I'm going to fall into a tactical world or subtactical world where a model in the traditional sense is going to go and, and tell me whether or not the missile hit the ship or not. So I've decided that at that point, that's a model. Well, but there are other things that could be represented by some sort of decision aid that's not being manipulated by the players necessarily that will provide necessary input to the game. And if it won't provide necessary input, why am I having it? Right? If nobody needs this information, why am I injecting it into my problem? The softer that stuff gets, the harder it gets to be able to have something which is fundamentally mathematically based to try to produce that in a way that the players aren't frustrated because it's just this magic black box that's telling them some information. Hence why I like things like the goal poster because it's much more transparent. Um, and the, the do no harm part, this is where I mentioned earlier where I have people who get way too enamored with the predictability of what is essentially an explanatory model. I go, oh, hang on. You, just because in this game, this one instance of this game that you ended up uh, burning through all of your air-to-air -air missiles in the first half of the campaign, 
does not mean that you can now extrapolate from my game to figure out what your next buy should be and go to Congress and get a grunge load more missiles. Maybe, but we need to do a whole lot more work to understand if what the snapshot of that model and human interaction created is and can be extrapolated to future combat and therefore future manning and whatnot. That, that's usually where I run into problems. People start to get worried, especially my boss. My boss always gets worried that someone's gonna look at my combat result outcome for my adjudication team and take it as a crystal ball answer for what will happen in a conflict with fill in the blank adversary and now begin making billion dollar decades long investment decisions based on what were three SMEs who were pressed for time on a Tuesday afternoon and had the result of me rolling dice because they were arguing. And that's gonna be the basis? <laughs> but unfortunately, if I dress it up too nice, if I make it look too pretty, they start to see more value in it than they would if they understood how I arrived at that decision. But oftentimes they don't see that part. All they know is that they took some action, they're looking at this cool map, and they've lost three destroyers, oh my God, I'll lose three destroyers in this situation in the future. I'll, maybe you will, you did today. You did today in the game. I've had some senior officers, Admiral Scott Swift was, it was a, a joy to game with because Admiral Swift understood where the value of gaming lie. And it wasn't in predicting the future. It was, in, it was to enable him to understand potential consequences and to get smarter about situations. So we had a game where he sent littoral combat ships up to do some countermine operations in heavily contested water and lost every one of them. But his takeaway wasn't like, wasn't, oh my God, I'll always lose these ships. He was like, well, now I better understand part of the risk calculus and a possible outcome. And if, I were to lose those ships, how might I respond in later operations because I've lost them? So now what do I do? So it's understanding that if then set up and not it will. If it does, what do I need to understand? What are possible downstream pieces? But I have far too many people who, who see that nuance and they simply look at the game and its model as a predictive machine that if they could run it, a, and I've had senior officers say, oh, can't we just go and load up the computer, run it 50,000 times and find the best outcome? No, <laughs> and I have a, in one of my adjudication talks, I have a, a, a bar graph about my drive to work back when I used to drive to work. So in my drive to work, it's a relatively benign activity, all right? I, I live all of 14 miles away from the Naval War College. And you'd think that, and I get up every day at the same time, okay? Alarm goes off, 6.15. That's when it goes off. I then for about a period of, uh, I guess it was about six months to a year, um, I just kept a little little plot of what time I walked into my office. And I had a rule, it was the clock on the wall and, and if it was the nearest minute or whatever. And I have a classic distribution curve that results. And now this is something pretty mundane. This is driving to work. <laughs> and yet I cannot predict statistically what time I will arrive at work every day. Like I can predict, and again, this is the difference between what does random mean in statistical models, right? I can predict given an incident angle or a, you know, a, a vector, uh, how far that ball is gonna go, right? And it works every time. Put the same number in the math formula, it comes out the same number every time. I, I can tell you how long that ball is gonna take to hit the ground if I let go of it from a, you know, a 20-story building. I cannot tell you exactly what's gonna happen every time I drive to work. And that's driving to work. Now. You want to apply the same kind of rigidity and certainty to a model which is trying to understand human warfare, which has got to be like one of the sloppiest things we do next to economics. Right? <laughs> My son's an economist, and, and he, he, he acutely appreciates the ideas that for as much as we model the hell out of the economy, we still get surprised. We still end up with bubbles. We still end up with crashes. It's like, what's up with that? I thought you guys knew what was going on. <laughs> he goes, yeah, well, the problem is the humans don't know the model because <laughs> they keep deviating from the models that they ought to do. So understanding the complexity and trying to understand what's the utility then? And it's not predictive. The utility is being able to anticipate and then react and not necessarily only handle predictivity. 
and the other example that I'll use real quick is this idea that with the weather, okay? When you're given the weather, if you predict an, a weather event, that's what people tend to prepare for, right? So if you simply say, it's going to rain today, people will take an umbrella. Now, if it doesn't rain, whoa! The only thing I prepared for was rain and it snowed. Yeah, well, if I had given you a you should anticipate rain or snow today, and here are the probabilities, you have a better sense of how you might want to prepare. But when you're given a unitary look at the future, you tend to have a unitary preparation for that. Now, I get it. When we're spending trillions of dollars and buying stuff that lasts decades, our ability to rapidly shift what we have to have the optimal equipment to fight a conflict is minimal. This is the old thing about you fight the war with the Navy you have, not the Navy you want. And people want to desperately get that right. And so they want to use gaming as a predictive tool and models, because models are, you know, models are models, math is math, right? And it'll tell me how many aircraft carriers I need to buy. I'm sorry, Chief Naval Operations, that's not our value. Okay, that's campaign analysis. And that's not what I do in the wargaming world. I want the people to be able to respond to modeled events and a range of events such that they are mentally prepared to handle whether it rains or snows or hails or sleets. Not that I only told you it was gonna rain and the only thing you bought were umbrellas. And damn it, we should have bought snow shovels. Well, the model said rain, but if we'd ran the model again, it said snow. Well, you only, you only played my game once. And I don't care how many times you play my game, I'll never give you all the possible outcomes that you need to be prepared for. I need to give you the skill sets to address whatever comes my way or your way, all right? Cause I won't fight, I'm, like, I'm too old for this problem anymore. But that, that's where I see the do no harm part is too many people become too, too reliant on the model and want to put far too much emphasis on the modeled results and not use it as one input to shape their decisions. You can never point to the model and say it was the model's fault because the model won't have the court martial. I mean, we, we use a tool analytic hierarchy process. It's a nice little tool for helping people understand a multi, multi criteria decision uh, aid. Um, and I tell people, if you use AHP, you can't at your court martial say, you can't blame me, the tool picked the course of action. And the tool is now therefore responsible for the collateral damage and the, and the loss of civilian life. N -n no, <laughs> no. You can never blame the model. You can never blame AHP. You can never blame, you have to own it. So if you're gonna own it, I'd like you to be, have, have a broad collection of tools, models included, to help shape your decision. And don't become over-reliant on the one-time model run as the answer. Models are helpful. <laughs> All models are wrong. Sometimes they're useful. I went philosophical on you. No, that's great. That's what I needed. <laughs> okay, we are at 403. I can hang out a bit. Um, if, you, if you need to pitch out, please do so. Uh, you don't hurt my feelings. And there I go. <laughs> Anybody else? Thanks again. This was great. Yeah, certainly. Again, we'll we'll put up the recording here uh, when we get it crunched and, and formatted. Hey, Pete, this is uh, Toby Wilford. I work in uh, CSO DME, same same place as uh, Zach you just spoke with. Um, yeah. Just curious, uh, just because I I'm new to uh, I'm new to uh, Department of State. I'm actually Army. I just came from UConn um, this summer. But uh, my question for it is just how much work have you done with Department of State, uh, you know, thus far? Yeah, so most of our work with state, um, we do a game in the spring, uh, typically in April. Um, we didn't do it this year, um, but we're starting planning for it for next year. Um, that it's a very high, high level Paul Mill game uh, where people and we use like uh, former State Department people in key roles to represent political leadership retired ambassadors, et cetera, um, who play the roles in that. Um, and so like I said, that's our, that's our big heavy Paul Mill game. Um, what we'd like to do more of um, is for the political component of some of our military games. We all understand that there's a political component. I mean, in theory, you know, the Clausewitzian approach that the military is just a tool to political ends, that we don't always have a keen appreciation for some of the State Department pieces parts. And we have done a couple of events where, like for, the, like for basing rights, right, where we'll get together with some folks from State Department and say, okay, look, 
here's the game, here's the, the part of the planet we're in. We're thinking that, you know, we're going to have, it's a Southeast Asia problem, these countries, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, et cetera. Um, where, where do you think we would have basing rights and, and not? And just, and it just always comes to this caveat going, well, what year are you playing? Well, it's, it's like 10 years out. It's we don't know. It's like, well, I, okay, okay, I, I understand that. But based on current treaties and, and past administrations, are we likely to or not? What we try to do is we try to get an understanding for those sorts of things. Because where we come back to State Department afterwards is we say, look, in the game, the players desperately wanted to base out of Vietnam. Right? And, and we let them because it, it, it opened up an interesting part of the game. Matter of fact, it was so interesting that we're doing follow-on work now, and it looks like that that could be a crucial country in future conflicts. What are we doing to engage Vietnam? All right, yeah, and, and that's kind of our connection then with State Department as we try to think about some of these things. Um, but we're always open to more relate, you know, with more relationships with different agencies um, to inform our play. We always caution people that this is look, we can't make a game that's all things to all people. And, and we've had some some epic failures along those lines, where we just have have you know too many cooks in the kitchen to have the game focused on a thing. But we're happy to have people who can come in and help us understand some of these little mini models, or to help us create uh, the initial conditions for play, or to be able to tell us in plenary sessions that's fascinating. You should be aware that the current administration would always would never could would, you know, do that. Or, or it's highly unlikely you'd ever get them to go along with that because of our long-term relationship and our current, you know, whatever. Um, so yes, we, we do do stuff. We don't do as much as we probably like to or should. Um, and we're always open for more, you know, more connections. Uh, no, that's, that's good. That's helpful. I mean, like I said, coming from UCOM uh, at that level, I saw it, we ran more games, you know, all the time uh, for all kinds of things. And uh, certainly saw the application and planning. And, and just like you said, it's not so that we know, you know, uh, pinpoint what we need to bring to the fight as much as uh, get to pull some different levers, uh, you know, and see, get a better idea of what might happen. Um, and yeah. I think old, that, that old saw about uh, the value of planning is it makes planners, not plans. <laughs> right, right. And I think that, you know, just being a new guy here in Department of State, that, that may be, uh, you know, uh, something that we can, that, we, that I can look at, um, from, uh, you know, going forward. So, yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate your presentation today. It was good. And it's good to, good to have uh, guys like you out there doing, of course. <laughs> Thanks. Anybody else? So I, I think we've I think we've we've wrung it out of them, Robert. Including Robert. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So another questions again. Um, uh, as we have in the past, these will be uh, they'll end up uh, uploaded. Uh, I know I saw Rex uh, Brennan was on here earlier, so these tend to end up on Pack Sims. Um, we're also in the process of putting up a YouTube channel uh, as well as a website to be able to stick all this on because uh, I know that the Google Drive can be a problem for folks uh, depending on your, your network that you're trying to access it over uh, to be able to give you access to also things like the PDF uh, version of the slide decks as well as things like some of the Excel tools I talked about today. So thanks everybody for coming. I, I, you know, I hope you got something out of it um, and uh, we'll come up with another topic for another time and uh, I'm sure Robert will pass that out. Uh, over to you, Robert. Yes. Thank you. Uh, right. It'll all be available. And uh, this is one we'll have to probably watch a couple of times to catch all the uh, information. Okay. All right. With that, uh, have a good evening. Thanks much.